Boa noite. Estamos aqui começando a nossa noite é, de sábado com uma mesa histórica com a nossa grande autora que já foi convidada algumas vezes e que este ano pôde estar entre nós. Então é uma honra estar aqui nesse encontro com a Jun Palahiri. É, essa me... Boa noite então todos a todos que estão aqui, aos que estão no telão, nos dois telões aqui na cidade, que estão nos assistindo pela internet também. Eu queria convidar vocês também a visitar os nossos perfis nas páginas das redes sociais. A Flip faz uma cobertura, coloca notícias e coisas relacionadas aos autores. É, bom, eu vou deixar essa, eu vou deixar a palavra com o nosso Ángel Gurria Quintana, jornalista mexicano, por favor. Vai em frente. Obrigado. Muito obrigado, Paulo. Boa noite a todo mundo. É, é um grande prazer estar com o Jun Palahiri para este, mais uma mesa da Flip. E vamos começar logo, introduzindo, apresentando a nossa convidada. Jumpa nasceu em Londres em 1967, mas cresceu em Rhode Island, nos Estados Unidos. Hoje mora na Itália. Sua estreia literária foi em 1999 com a coletânea Interpreter of Maladies, Intérprete de Males, que logo lhe valeu, lhe valeu o prêmio Pulitzer. Ela tem publicado outro volume de contos, Unaccustomed Earth, e dois romances, O Xará, 2003, e o romance que está lançando agora pela Biblioteca Azul Globo Livros, Água Pés, que foi indicado para o Man Booker no Reino Unido. E é desse livro que ela vai ler um trecho para começar a conversa. Jumpa, welcome to Farachi. Thank you. You wrote in uh, a wonderful piece uh, in The New Yorker that being a writer means taking the leap from listening to saying, listen to me. And so here we are, all poised and ready to listen to you read uh, a passage out of the lowland. Thank you and good evening. Thank you so much for coming. They'd never set foot in the Tolly Club. Like most people in the vicinity, they'd passed by its wooden gate, its brick walls, hundreds of times. Until the mid-40s, from behind the wall, their father used to watch horses racing around the track. He'd watched from the street, standing among the betters and other spectators, unable to afford a ticket or to enter the club's grounds. But after the Second World War, around the time Subhash and Udayan were born, the height of the wall was raised so that the public could no longer see in. Bismillah, a neighbor, worked as a caddy at the club. He was a Muslim who had stayed on in Taliganj after partition. For a few paisha, he sold them golf balls that had been lost or abandoned on the course. Some were sliced like a gash in one skin, revealing a pink rubbery interior. At first, they hit the dimples balls back and forth with sticks. Then Bismillah also sold them a putting iron with a shaft that was slightly bent. A frustrated player had damaged it striking it against a tree. Bismillah showed them how to lean forward, where to place their hands. Loosely determining the objective of the game, they dug holes in the dirt and tried to coax the balls in. Though a different iron was needed to drive the ball greater distances, they used the putter anyway. But golf wasn't like football or cricket, not a sport the brothers could satisfactorily improvise. In the dirt of the playing field, Bismillah scratched out a map of the Tolly Club. He told them that closer to the clubhouse, there was a swimming pool, stables, a tennis court, restaurants where tea was poured from silver pots, special rooms for billiards and bridge, gramophones playing music, bartenders in white coats who prepared drinks called Pink Lady and Gin Fizz. The club's management had recently put up more boundary walls to keep intruders away, but Bismillah said that there were still sections of wire fencing where one might enter along the western edge. They waited until close to dusk when the golfers headed off the course to avoid the mosquitoes and retreated to the clubhouse to drink their cocktails. 
They kept the plan to themselves, not mentioning it to other boys in the neighborhood. They walked to the mosque at their corner, its red and white minarets distinct from the surrounding buildings. They turned onto the main road, carrying the putting iron, two kerosene tins. They crossed to the other side of Technician Studio. They headed toward the paddy fields where the Adi Ganga once flowed, where the British had once sailed boats to the Delta. These days it was stagnant, lined with the settlements of Hindus who'd fled from Dhaka, from Rajshahi, from Chittagong, a displaced population that Calcutta accommodated but ignored. Since partition a decade ago, they had overwhelmed parts of Taliganj, the way monsoon rain obscured the lowland. Some of the government workers had received homes in the exchange program, but most were refugees arriving in waves stripped of their ancestral land. A rapid trickle, then a flood. Shubhash and Udayan remembered them, a grim procession, a human herd, a few bundles on their heads, infants strapped to their parents' chests. They made shelters of canvas or thatch, walls of woven bamboo. They lived without sanitation, without electricity, in shanties next to garbage heaps, in any available space. They were the reason the Adi Ganga, on the banks of which the Tully Club stood, was now a sewer canal for southwest Calcutta. They were the reason for the club's additional walls. Shubhash and Udayan found no wire fencing. They stopped at a spot where the wall was low enough to scale. They were wearing shorts. Their pockets were stuffed with golf balls. Bismillah said they would find plenty more inside the club where the balls lay on the ground alongside the pods that fell from tamarind trees. Udayan flung the putting iron over the wall, then one of the kerosene tins. Standing on the remaining tin would, it, would give Subhash enough leverage to make it over. But Udayan was a few inches shorter in those days. Lace your fingers, Udayan said. Subhash brought his hands together. He felt the weight of his brother's foot the worn sole of his sandal, then his whole body bearing down for an instant. Quickly, Udayan hoisted himself up. He straddled the wall. Should I stand guard on this side while you explore? Shubhash asked him. What fun would that be? What do you see? Come, see for yourself. Shubhash nudged the kerosene tin closer to the wall. He stepped onto it, feeling the hollow structure wobble beneath him. Let's go, Shubhash. Udayan readjusted himself, dropping down so that only his fingertips were visible. Then he released his hands and fell. Shubhash could hear him, breathing hard from the effort. You're all right? Of course, now you. Shubhash gripped the wall with his hands, hugging it with his chest, scraping his knees. As usual, he was uncertain whether he was more frustrated by Udayan's daring or with himself for his lack of it. Shubhash was 13, older by 15 months, but he had no sense of himself without Udayan. From his earliest memories, at every point, his brother was there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, without giving too much away, can you tell us a little bit more about where this fits in the book. This is a, a passage from early on in the book, the story of these two brothers. And um, for, for people who may wish to read the novel then, just give us a sense of how it unfolds. Well, I, this is, I think, a, a key moment in the lives of these two brothers and the triangle uh, that, that I set up between them, among them, and, and the presence of this club. Uh, which they are both attracted to, um, but one wants to uh, push forward and, and, and uh, cross, cross, a, cross a line that he shouldn't, and the other one, Subhash, is sort of following behind. And, and this represents, I think, the dynamic between the brothers in general. Subhash is a little bit older, but in a sense, he feels like the younger brother uh, a bit in his younger brother's shadow. And, um, and the presence of this club in the middle of a, a very um, poor to middle class neighborhood in Calcutta um, 
represents, foreshadows um, a political movement uh, that is um, that will come into into the, these boys' lives in the next ten or fifteen years or so when they're university students. Um, uh, an attempted Maoist revolution in India. Uh, so the presence of this club, the, an exclusive space um, reserved for the wealthy, for the privileged, be, becomes representative of, of that movement itself. And, um, and so the brothers will have, it, it becomes, the club becomes a, you know, a, a place that they return to in their, in their minds um, over time. You've, you've said that um, this is a book that you conceived of before any of your books were actually published. And the book that you say you've been sort of trying to work on from the beginning. Can you tell us about that sort of early conception? Well, um, so Tali Gunj, the neighborhood I describe in this um, small excerpt, is uh, the neighborhood where my father was raised in Calcutta. As a result, it was uh, a place I, I came to know over the course of my life, visiting every you know, two years. We would go to Calcutta for a, a, a fairly long period, uh, two or three months, often at a time. And so it was a neighborhood that I, I came to know uh, where my, my grandparents lived, my aunts and uncles lived, where my father had been raised, and where I would have been raised uh, if my father had decided not to leave India. And uh, so it, it always represented the life not lived, in a way. Um, and at a certain point, um, when I was a, a teenager, I learned that uh, two brothers who lived very close to my grandparents' home had been killed one evening by the paramilitary um, during this uh, revolutionary movement uh, in Calcutta known as the, the Noxalite movement. Um, I learned that they had been killed uh, in, in, in cold blood in front of their family members. Um, their parents, their relatives had been lined up uh, to watch the, this execution. Um, and I was, you know, very uh, troubled by, by what I learned. And um, especially because I was familiar with the place, I was all the more troubled that, that such a violent um, history uh, had been so recent. Um, and, and that uh, the parents of those, those brothers were still living in the neighborhood and that there was a sort of ghost of this time still lying over the place. Um, and so I, I became curious about it and I, I started asking questions and I started reading a little bit about it and, and, um, and eventually once I started uh, writing fiction, once I started trying to write fiction, um, thinking of ideas, thinking of books, stories that, that I might write about, uh, I thought of this. I thought of this time, I thought of that place, um, and I started working with, uh, with, the, with the scene that had been uh, recounted to me, the moment, that the evening of, of this, this, um, this terrible uh, killing that had happened there. And uh, so it started there. It was a very frustrating start. Uh, I, I, I had you know, very little real sense of the history, the politics. Um, all I had really was a sense of the place, the atmosphere, which I knew, um, which I had inside of me. But I really had very little formal understanding of, of um, what led to that moment, why those those boys, those young men were, were killed. Um, so after working on, on the idea for maybe a year, maybe six months to a year, uh, trying to describe th that scene, um, I abandoned the project. I felt that it really just was not moving forward, was not opening up in the way that um, 
it needed to. And, and so I, I set the idea aside. Uh, and I went on to write my, my other books. Um, I published my first three books. Uh, so there was a 10 year hiatus when, during which I was, I had moved on from that idea, but the idea never really let me go. And from time to time I would think, but there's that idea I began with. And so finally after the 10 year hiatus, uh, when I, after I finished my, um, uh, my third book, I thought, well, now what? And I thought, now is the time to face uh, that idea and, and, and to see if it can work. And so it was a very long gestation. When one reads about your life in, in things you've written, essays you've written, and um, what, you say, what you said just now, um, these suggest that the lowland uh, is perhaps the most autobiographical of your works in some of the settings, in some of the character types, very frugal father and so on. And uh, I wanted to ask where you stand on, on this common notion that all fiction is ultimately autobiographical. Some people would argue that um, that's not true, but how, how do you feel about that? I think I can argue both sides of, of the question. I mean, I, in terms of, I mean, is the lowland autobiographical because I personally spent time in that place? I don't know. I mean, I, I think my, my definition of autobiographical fiction has always been working from my personal set of experiences. So in that sense, I think the Lowland is not at all an autobiographical novel, having never lived really in, in India even, um, not having grown up in any of the time periods that any of the characters uh, grow up in. I mean, there's only one character in the, in the novel, um, the character of Bella, who is, you know, could be uh, described as, you know, a, a young, a girl who's born in the United States to parents of Bengali origin. So that's my, you know, biographical description. Um, but she's not me, and her experiences are not mine at all, and her parents are not my parents. And, and, and if anything, I think The Lowland is the least uh, personal of my books in that None of the, I mean, each of the characters it really did come out of, out of nowhere. Um, you know, the, 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 the two principal, the brothers are loosely modeled more on very younger cousins of my, my parents. Uh, because my, my parents are born in, my father was born in 31, my mother in 39, so they're too old for this movement. And anyway, they were living in the United States when this, all of this was happening. So they were also at a geographical remove. Um, I think, you know, in a sense, my previous books have more, there are more threads of, you know, characters who share uh, what I would call my core experiences in terms of having been raised in the U.S. by Bengali parents in the 1970s and 80s, um, the experience of going back to India as a, as a visitor who doesn't quite belong but doesn't quite not belong, all of that, uh, those, those ingredients um, feel closer to me. But, uh, but this book, less, so... Uh, on the other hand, in spite of what I just said, I feel uh, I must put a part of myself into each of my characters. Uh, you know, it, it may be, you know, just a, a little extract, a, a small part of me that I then um, put into a petri dish and it grows in another way, you know, but it does come from me and I, I'm aware of that. Um, even if I'm thinking of somebody else, it's, it's mediated through me. Uh, the characters are mediated through me. And alongside these um, sort of 
bits of you which you feed into a story like this, there is uh, a significant element of sort of what we could say sort of period element uh, which must have involved some research and I was, as, as I read along, I was wondering how much research was involved and how you manage that research so that it doesn't get in the way of telling the story. Well, the, the research was also very drawn out. You know, when I, when I first started working, when I first wanted to work with this, um, I asked my father, who is um, a librarian, to lend me two books from the library, <laughs> the library where he works in Rhode Island. So this was in 1997. And he said, okay. And he, took, he, took, he gave me two books out of the library. And I had them. And because he's worked in the library for 45 years, he has some special privileges and he doesn't have to return the books he takes out every two weeks like normal people. And so I kept them. And every year, every two years, he would say, you know those two books I lent you? Are you done with them yet? And I would say, not yet. I'm still, I'm still working on it. And because in reality, I, would, I was reading these books. I was trying to read these books. I really was. And I was taking notes and everything. And I, because I wanted to educate myself about what was the Noxalite movement and why did it happen and why did it fail and all of these things. And I was, you know, I have notebooks full of all the dates, the facts, the, um, the, the main, the principal characters in the movement, the ideology behind the movement. And yet, it wasn't really penetrating. And it wasn't, it wasn't, something was not connecting with the, the facts and the, the story. They weren't matching up. But I kept these books, these two books, uh, in my study for years, for years. And then finally, um, slowly, um, as the characters became more real, the history in those two books began to become more and more clear to me and more relevant. And then I began to realize, oh, this would be important to the story. This would be less important. And, and just to fast forward, I returned those books to my father um, two years ago. <laughs> I said, here, I'm done. <laughs> and it was a great, a great source of relief. Um, I think he had given up hope by then that the library would ever see those books again. Um, but in, in addition to those two books, um, I did do, I mean, the research was sort of staggered over time. I, um, I watched films uh, that were made, Bengali films that were made by very interesting directors uh, that, you know, were, were, were directed around that time, dealt with Noxalite characters, the effects of the, the movement on the city, on Calcutta, outside of Calcutta, just to get a sense. Um, there's a vast literature about uh, about these years, but um, most of it is written in Bengali, which is a language I cannot read very well. Um, and so I was, you know, I had to rely on translations. I had to rely on sometimes my mother reading me some short stories or a poem that would refer to, the, to that period. Um, but I found the most useful thing really was talking to people. And in that sense, I was very privileged because even in the United States, uh, my parents have a very, very large circle of, uh, of Bengali friends. And they range from their age to much younger. So once I started write, writing the book, I, I would direct my questions to people uh, family friends who had, for example, lived in Calcutta in the late 60s and early 70s, remembered those years, remembered what it was like to walk on the streets, go to university, get on the bus, remembering that fear that they had in them, remembering what happened in the neighborhoods after dark, all of these details that, that my own parents couldn't give me, given that they were not, uh, they weren't there themselves. 
Um, and then when I would go back to India, I would start asking my relatives, you know, well, what was it like? And were you afraid? And did you know people who were involved in the movement? And so on. And so I, I found that was really um, the greatest source of information because in the end, it's the novel has a political background, but it's not really a political novel. You know, in the end, it's a novel about a, a family that's that's torn apart by uh, an act of political violence. And um, and then in the very end of the, the writing process, about two years before I finished the book, I went to Calcutta with the specific uh, hope to, to speak to some people who had been uh, directly involved in the movement. Uh, but I wanted to wait until I had my story more or less in place, the, the emotional side of the story uh, more, in le more or less in place. And at that point it was, though speaking to these people um, was yet another peeling back of, the, of, of this unknown that I was exploring. Uh, and, but it was you know, kind of a key moment to go and to, to talk to them. And, and then I was able to return to the United States and fairly quickly finish up uh, the final drafts of the book. But the, the, the challenge then becomes um, how you sort of wrestle all of that information into the story without letting it sort of overwhelm the, you, the author. Yes, I mean, I think and it's in, it was an interesting challenge for me, particularly because most Bengali readers, for example, would not need this, uh, this time in India's, in Calcutta's history, explained to them. But I felt that I wasn't able to write the book simply by referring to it in passing and moving on. Uh, mainly because I was writing it and I needed for myself to understand. And I, what I felt, um, you know, I think once I had a grip on the characters, it became much clearer because then as the events are unfolding, as the history is, is, is unrolling for them, they themselves are absorbing what is happening. I mean, I have, you know, I... There are moments when the brothers are listening to reports on the radio or reading a newspaper article or whatever it is, and, and they themselves, in fictional time, are learning about what is happening. And I found that, I, I hope that that was the way in which both the reader and the characters together are, are, are experiencing what is, what is happening. Uh, but of course, no, one does not want to overburden the narrative with, um, with excessive... Uh, detail and um, and it was interesting as I was writing it because there were sort of two camps I felt of of early readers and one camp was saying I don't really care about this history I just want to focus on what's happening and other people would say no 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 I really need to understand what's happening in order to focus on the family and and so I realized that there were it was a very delicate uh, balancing act in terms of giving enough detail uh, without, uh, as I said, without overburdening the reader. This is your fourth book, but only your second novel. Um, your debut was a collection of short stories for which you were awarded the Pulitzer. Um, how do you privilege one form over the other? When do you know that an idea is ripe for a novel such as this? Um, and, and when do you think this, this can be contained in short short form? I tend to know very quickly. I tend to, you know, I think of everything as a story. I mean, Chekhov wrote stories and Tolstoy wrote, wrote stories, and even his novels are, they're stories, you know? They have a beginning, they have a middle, they have, they have an end. It's, it's a narrative, it's fictional narrative, you know? Um, and, and generally, when I have an idea for something, uh, and this is true even from the beginning. Um, I mean, I, I began by writing very short stories. I mean, they weren't even stories. I, they were more like paragraphs. Um, but, and then they grew into two or three page stories and then those 
became five or seven page stories and slowly slowly they 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 um, the pages accumulated um, but for example when I was writing you know so I began by writing short stories and then at one point for example the idea for the lowland came to me and this was when I had just started out as a writer I was really very it was very early on and I knew it would be a novel. There was, there was absolutely no way I felt that I could just do justice to, to, to the idea that I had within um, the, the tighter constraints of a, of a short story, even though I had never written a novel before. But I think this comes from my experience of reading short stories and reading novels. And I think, so as a reader, I had an inherent sense of the limits and the liberties of, 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 of each of the forms. I mean, I think each form is, you know, as a reader, I've never distinguished uh, between the two in terms of one being more important or one, you know, I think one has to respect and understand the essence of the story. And I think some stories are meant to be told in a, in a relatively brief um, arc uh, and 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 others not, and then of course there's this great gray zone of storytelling as well. And writers like Alice Munro or Mavis Gallant, Chekhov, Tolstoy, who are sort of skirting between the what is technically called a novel and what is technically called a short story. So, you know, I really don't pay that much heed to, you know, it's not uh, sort of apples or oranges for me. Um, and uh, so, and so similarly with the namesake, my second, my first novel, my second book, when the idea came, I knew it would be a novel, even though I hadn't even written it yet. But I thought, well, this idea would naturally tend to be a novel, and and it was. Um, so I, I think it comes from a kind of instinctive sense of each form. And, and what each form does well and the ways in which each form, um, you know, can best tell the story. I think it's about best telling the story. And, 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 and unfortunately, I think there are a lot of novels that would have been better off as short stories. You, just, you mentioned uh, the namesake. It was turned into a film, of course. Uh, were you involved in the process in any way? I was sort of lightly involved. Um, uh, I like to explain my role as a, a grandmotherly one in that I was very fond of the creative process without really feeling any responsibility toward it. So I had a, you know, I would come every now and then for a visit. I would visit the set and then I would, you know, go back to my own, uh, my own work. And it was a wonderful arrangement uh, in the end. Um, I, I... I appear in it for, I think, two seconds. Uh, my daughter, who's here and sitting in front of me, has a little cameo role. Uh, my son was there on the set too, but he was fast asleep. So, um, and my parents, my sister, I mean, Mira Nair, the director, uh, who is um, now also a friend of mine, um, she wanted to kind of include my family and make it a, uh, almost a home video in in this one particular scene and and it's it's um you know so we said fine and we all went and went into the makeup trailer one day and went through it all but but in in reality no i mean from the creative standpoint i was really not um i did not participate i did not work on the screenplay i did not uh you know i looked at the screenplay i maybe said two or three things um in terms of feedback, but I, I felt, you know, when when Mira approached me about the book, uh, about making a movie out of the book, I just, um, I just said, please take it and make it your own, and uh, and um, because I knew when she was talking to me about it that that it was a need that she felt, but because I had already written the book and felt already a great distance from it, it we didn't share that same need. Uh, and I was, I needed at that time to, to write my other books. Uh, and, and, and so, 
it was a very amicable kind of um, agreement between us. And, and, it, and, and in the end, I was very pleased with what she did. We were talking a minute ago about interpreter of maladies um, winning the Pulitzer. And um, am I right to think that your, your father, even after you were awarded the Pulitzer, still sternly reminded you that writing stories is not something that you can rely on as a profession? That is true. <laughs> and I think he's right, in a way. I know, I mean, I, I don't think... Um, I mean, I, uh, I never dreamed I would be able to make a living off of my writing. I never uh, dared to think that was possible. And uh, somehow um, it, it became possible. Um, and yet my approach to it remains, you know, I remain a bit skeptical of being a writer and, and making my, my living off of my work. Because once that happens, one is inevitably drawn into the business side of it, the commercial side of it, the marketing side of it. Um, and, uh, I mean, it becomes a product that you create and, and your work is no longer just about making the work, but it's about promoting the work you know, getting the work read and all of this and the role you play in that. Um, and so in a way, I think what my father was... I mean, my father is a very risk-averse person and writing is an extremely risky enterprise even for the most fortunate of, of, of writers. Um, and I was always prepared to make my living some other way. And... Um, I, I think it's important to to know that. I mean, I, and, and also to know what a, an extraordinary privilege it is to write and to be rewarded for your writing. Um, I mean, there are many, many people in the world who who write and who write well, and there are only a handful uh, of those who are able to really live off of their writing. And and um, I think it's a little bit in the end the toss of the dice in terms of who is able to live off of their writing and who has to support themselves in another way. Um, and I, I, I always think about that and I respect those people and, and, and um, anyway, so that's how I still approach it, you know, uh, being grateful but also not assuming that it will be a sustainable way to to live, and and sometimes I prefer keeping it in its own its own protected place. You know, to explore this uh, process of becoming uh, a writer, um, I uh, I'd like to take you take you back, sort of way back. Um, you've written that. Um, your love of writing led you to commit an act of theft <laughs> at a very early age. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this, this um, vignette, this episode uh, of your early interest in writing, um, which to me seems to perfectly encapsulate uh, what many writers do to act, uh, writing as, in, in a way, sort of an act of theft, if you, if you wish. Well, the incident is, uh, um, that I write about is, you know, when I was um, six, seven, eight years old, um, you know, I was learning, I learned how to read, and, and as soon as I learned how to read, I, I began writing. So I was writing, by the time I was seven, I was reading pretty, in a secure way. I, I remember learning how to read, so that would have been five, six years old. And by seven, I was, I was reading. And I have memories of reading. And, and as soon as I was able to read uh, comfortably, I started, I would mimic the things I would read in my own words. So I would read a story about a girl who lives on an island off the coast of Brazil, let's say. And then I would write my own version of a girl who lives on an island off the coast of Brazil, you know, so I would copy, literally I would copy everything that I was reading. 
and um, but how to do this. Uh, and so my teachers in school um, had these, their desk was always in front of a cupboard, and in the cupboard they kept all of their supplies, and so they were, you know, the pencils, the, all of the things that, uh, the books, and then there were always, there was always a shelf of notebooks, and they were either blue or they were kind of a, like the color of your trousers, kind of a creamy color, and um, and when they would open the note, when I, when they would open the drawer every now and then to get something, I would look at the notebooks and just I would be just filled with uh, desire, uh, greed. Um, I wanted one of those notebooks so badly for myself because you know they would distribute them for the spelling and the math and everything, but I wanted my own notebook and. Um, and so I was driven, you know, there were moments when uh, the teacher left the room or maybe we were left alone for a recess unsupervised or something. And I, I would, I, I was, um, I stole these notebooks. I mean, not a lot, but, you know, I take one. And, um, and I would write my stories in them. And there was something about the fact that they were the school notebooks, because I suppose I could have written in, in another notebook I'm sure if I'd asked one of, you know, if I had asked my parents, can I have a notebook, they would have bought me one, or maybe there was even a notebook in my own house that I could have appropriated, but for some reason, it had to be that notebook. It had to be the teacher's, it had to be a notebook from the, the teacher's cupboard, and so I would steal these notebooks and, uh, and write my, my little stories in them, and, um, you know, somewhere in my parents' house, they are still there in a closet somewhere. Um, but, uh, but in a sense, yes, I mean, writers, one can say all writers are taking from life indiscriminately, you know, observing the world around them, uh, taking from this person, that person, this detail, that detail, and um, creating their stories. Uh, you know, in a more metaphorical sense. Thank you. Um, we, we have some questions coming in already, okay. and we can start sort of um, dropping these into our conversation. Um, the first one to come in is from someone called Ana Maria Kobe. Uh, it's a very short question, which may require a very long answer. Um, does love require suffering? That's a <laughs> short we can, question. We can, yes, we, <laughs> we can think about that one. Well, I mean, love involves a lot of things, a lot of emotions, a great range of emotions. I think, um, I mean, when one loves somebody, there is there is profound joy, but there is also the anxiety uh, of that love slipping away, of that person slipping away, uh, of that love ending uh, in some fashion. And even the happiest of love stories must end at some point because we are mortal and we are meant to end. And so love is meant to end. Now, one could argue for posthumous love and love beyond the grave and those sorts of things. Um, but I think all of us as human beings uh, are aware of our, our time on earth and, and uh, so even in, in, in the happiest of situations, yes, there is the suffering of, you know, one, one loves someone uh, with that awareness, with that dark side. I mean, it's not just the daytime, there's always the nighttime, and that is what creates the full cycle. Um, so I would say, yes, there is a, a, an element of, of love. I mean, love is also a risk. Love is also a leap into the unknown. Love is also uh, an opening up, an investigation of of oneself and, and, and one's relationship to, to another person. It can be very terrifying, you know, so it's, it's a 
it's a very complex experience. It's, it's not um, to be taken lightly, <laughs> I suppose. Um, in um, the lowlands, obviously, uh, love in, in its many forms, sort of brotherly uh, love you know, from a father to a daughter and so on, um, is, a, is sort of an outstanding theme. And there are some of the themes that have been recurrent in your short stories and your previous novel, um, dislocation, migration. Um, to me, one of the outstanding themes in the novel, and I don't know if you think this is a fair um, comment to make, is sort of incompleteness. Um, and, and many of the people seeking love uh, are trying to, um, are trying to sort of complete something about themselves that they've been missing. Well, I think love is, among other things, a, a desire for connection and, and a, a sense of wholeness. And often that is, you know, in the lowland, that is what, um, you know, the characters are, it, they're interesting because they're both seeking liberation. They're seeking to define themselves apart from their family, their siblings, their parents, um, their children even, uh, and at the same time, they're searching for connection, they're regretting, they're both separating themselves and they're regretting the separation, the state of separation. Um, but I think this is very human, and I think people uh, are inherently confused and full of contradictions, and don't move in predictable ways in life, in love, in families, in relationships. Um, you know, I was, I was trying to, I was interested in writing a novel in the lowland in which none of the characters is entirely innocent. Uh, and, and that lack of innocence is, is played out in these relationships, these different forms of love parental, sibling, romantic, what have you. Um, but there's, there's betrayal, there's secrets, there's, there's cruelty, there's lack of communication. Um, there are all of these things that, that, are, that are sort of filigreed into um, what, is, what can be seen as a, should be a more conventional relationship between brothers, between parent and child, between husband and wife, what have you. Thank you. Um, a question from Leandro. It's, it's a whole set of questions, and perhaps we can um, include a couple here. Um, do you still feel compelled to tell stories about Indian American characters? Would you consider moving on to American Italian characters, for instance? We we said earlier that you you live in Rome now, um, so yes. Do, do do you think you might uh, consider looking beyond uh, characters who share your own experience and your own background? Um, I think I have already begun to look beyond that. Um, I'm interested right now in uh, in a slight, in a more, I think in a more abstract approach, maybe, to my work. Um, thinking about characters who are not uh, rooted um, in the strict sense of the word to a place. Uh, I'm interested in, af after having written four books w in which location, setting, it plays such a central role, either the, 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 the fact of the setting or the lack of the setting, missing a place, being in a place, you know, the presence of America, the lack of India, for example, in many of the previous books. Um, and, and, and particularly after having written The Lowland, in which I had to work very hard to conjure a place. Uh, I mean, the book is set both in the India and the United States, but I had to work very hard to conjure uh, not only the Calcutta of the 
1970s and earlier, which I really didn't know very well, but also Rhode Island, which is where I was raised, but the Rhode Island of my deep childhood, which of course I am now at a great remove from, and, and, and because they're real places, and I was talking about real time and real place, uh, at this point in my life, I just, I want some freedom from uh, the energy that is required in terms of rendering uh, real place in real time. Um, for example, I'm, I'm interested in writing, a, you know, uh, some, I'm, I'm interested in writing about uh, something maybe set in no dis identifiable place, no identifiable uh, country. I mean, the one, the one thing I've written since The Lowland is a, a short story, and it, it has no setting. I mean, there's a setting, but it's, it's a generic setting, and it could be anywhere. It could be here, it could be China, it could be whatever. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing in the story that indicates that it's any specific place. And I, I feel like my work is moving... Uh, more and more in this direction. And I think it also, in terms of character, um, I mean, all of my work has, has circled around the idea of identity, lack of identity, multiple identity, you know, divided identity, and so on. And, I, and that continues to interest me uh, as a writer, as a person. But I think, you know, now I'm looking at it from another from another point of view, so that writers like, um, like Pirandello, like Pessoa, uh, these are the way they look at identity, lack of identity, multiple identity, the search for identity on a, in a more abstract way. Uh, this interests me very much right now. This, this excites me. Um, and my sense is that my work may be moving in this direction, but having not really written anything else, um, you know, I can't predict. But but my sense from what I'm, what I'm reading and what I'm th the way I've been thinking is that's my my guess. Thank you, um, Raquel says that she's been following your the, the, the texts articles you've been writing in Italian for uh, a magazine called Internazionale and uh, asks you to talk a little bit about your writing in Italian. So, so just for the record, how many languages do you speak? Three. Three, okay. But, so English, Bengali, and Italian. Italian, Spanish? I follow Spanish yes. um, by now. I mean, my husband speaks Spanish perfectly. So I, you know, for many years I've, I've absorbed a lot of Spanish just being with him. And, and now that my Italian has become strong, um, my, my, my comprehension of Spanish, um, much like my husband's comprehension of Italian when he first got there, you know, there's a sort of base that's, um, that's very helpful. So that, you know, when I went to Spain uh, earlier this year, I was able to have interviews with where the interviewer was asking me questions in Spanish and I wasn't able to answer in Spanish, but I, I understood what they were saying. So, um, and it's a very interesting form of conversation when you, when you comprehend, but you can't, you can't um, turn it around and express yourself. Um, in any case, um, yes, I speak, I speak now three languages and I, I have working comprehension of, of Spanish. I studied French when I was in high school, so I could, I mean, I could read, I can read in French more or less, but I can't speak French. Um, the the Internazionale pieces began, um, uh, well, they're, they're part of a longer process, and I should probably explain the context. Um, so I, I moved to Italy two years ago, over, a little over two years ago, no, two years ago. Um, so, and before I left, um, I had been studying Italian for many, many years in, in America. I don't exactly understand why, but I was. Um, I, I, you know, I went to 
Florence many years ago, and um, I came back from that trip uh, wanting to learn Italian. And it, so it started as a kind of hobby, and, um, and then the hobby became slowly more serious over time. And then at one point, um, I went to Rome, and I, I had a very strong connection with the city, and I felt that it was a city that I had to know and I had to live in. And, and so, you know, various factors kind of accumulated, and I, then I became very serious about studying Italian. In the United States, I started working with various tutors and, you know, really trying to somehow be able to speak basic Italian, um, which I did. I learned how to have, carry on a basic conversation in Italian without ever having lived in Italy. Um, but then we decided, my family and I decided to move to Italy for, for our time. And uh, so before I did that, I, I made a strange decision and I decided to stop reading in English. So I stopped, I basically stopped reading everything uh, in English, um, apart from the newspaper and occasional things. Um, and I started reading only in Italian, only Italian novels, Italian short stories. And, and then I moved to Italy, and, and then very quickly after moving to Italy, I started, you know, I keep a diary, and I, uh, I started writing in my diary in Italian. And it was a very unconscious switch. Uh, but I felt, I, somehow I think all of these years, all of these you know, all of the work I had put in to studying Italian from a distance, suddenly, now that, I was in, now that I was in the country and I didn't have to leave after a week or 10 days, um, it was just so, something happened and I just started, I found myself writing in Italian. And it was a really, I mean, when I look back at now at how, what I was writing, I mean, it's, it, it was literally like learning how to write all over again. I mean, I was writing at the level of, I don't know, a six-year-old child, you know, full of mistakes, everything misspelled, all the grammar all over the place, you know, really just um, a state of absolute uh, imperfection. And it was embarrassing, but at the same time, it was so exciting to me because I felt, I felt that first excitement of being a child and learning how to write and the sense of freedom that it gave me. And, and I never thought I would feel that again in my life, but I started feeling it again, trying to express myself in, an, in another, in a new language. Um, because, you know, of course, when I was writing in English, it was also a new language for me. You know, it was a language that I had recently acquired as a result of going to school and, and was a, a language that I, that I was speaking only part of the time in my life because most of my life was still at home with my parents in Bengali. So English was the new exciting language. And so learning how to write in, in it gave me this great sense of, of um, you know, a heightened liberty because it wasn't the language that I was used to. It was a new language. So anyway, so I... So I started keeping the journal in Italian, and then very quickly, within a couple of months, I, I wrote a short story in Italian, and I really don't even know now how I did it, because, I mean, I just, I wrote it, and it came out very quickly, and I thought, what have I just done? This is just the strangest thing. And, and so it, then I really began to question what was going on with me as a writer. I thought, why, why am I doing this? What is happening? And so I started keeping little notes um, over the course of my first year in, in Italy about this experience of uh, living, working, thinking, writing in a new language and, and what it was turning over inside of me. Um, you know, I, and I, I just, and I, I would, um, I had this little notebook and it was strange because in the beginning of, in the, in the front part of the notebook, I was writing all the new words I was learning every day and, you know, the, the constructions and the idiomatic phrases and everything. And then from the back end of the notebook, 
I was writing these very personal um, reflections on what, how the experience, what the emotional dimension of learning a new language was, uh, especially for a writer. What, it, what does it mean for a writer to, to, not, to write without authority, you know, which is what I think the, the, the essence of writing in Italian for me is, is um, it's, it's a form of writing in which I am inherently weak. And, and the first metaphor that came to my mind remains, I think, the strongest, which is that I feel that I'm writing with my left hand. Uh, being someone who normally writes with her right hand. And, and it's, this, it's a form of writing, and I can do it, but I know that I have my strength tied behind me, and, and I'm just moving forward anyway in this very kind of slightly out of control, um, slightly exaggerated way in which I don't have the subtle control that one usually wants as a writer. So it's kind of going against the grain of what writing is all about, which is trying to express something in the best, most elegant, most subtle of ways. Uh, so there's a crudeness to my Italian writing. And there's, a sense of, there's a sense of survival in, implied in my Italian writing. I mean, in my English writing, I'm very, you know, I have a nice house and furniture and, you know, um, hot meals on a tray in my Italian writing, I'm, I'm really out in the wild in a way. I'm camping and I'm just, I've just got a few things and I've just got my little knapsack with my words in it and it's on my back and I reach into it and I'm, you know, there's a set, that's the limitation um, that I find so interesting. Anyway, so, the, so these pieces in Internazionale grew out of my little note taking. Uh, because at a certain point I realized that the, that the series of notes I was taking had a, there was a narrative there. And, and so those notes started growing into little reflections on um, my encounter with Italian. And, and what's been most interesting, now the pieces have all been published and um, the project is, has come to an end and, um, and, and will be published uh, next year as a little book. Um, but, but what was most interesting in, in, in the course of writing the book, I mean, it started out as a, as a meditation on, you know, my attraction to a, a third language, a foreign language, a new language. But in the end, it, it kind of comes back around to my origins. And, 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 and it's really about the triangle between the languages, the three languages that, I, that I've known, um, two imposed and one coveted, sought out, courted, uh, you know. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, um, I mean, the great revelation for me, perhaps it's not really a revelation at all, but it struck me when I was writing these pieces that, um, I'm a writer without a true language. And, and perhaps, men, there, perhaps there are many writers who feel this, um, but I truly feel this. And I, and I think that it's crystallized for me. I mean, everything I've written about until now in my life, all of, the, all of my characters, all of their search for who they are and what they are and where they come from and the different cultural, uh, forces that are that that make them that that divide them. I think all of this, in in the end, can be reduced to a, on a linguistic level, and the fact that I have a very imperfect relationship to all three languages that I speak. I don't come to any of them. I, none of them feel 100% mine. Um, Whereas, I mean, there are examples of writers who write outside of their language, right? But, you know, someone like Nabokov, for example, wrote in English masterfully, but his, his sense of identification and belonging to Russian was, was total and complete, and he never questioned that. Whereas I'm someone who's questioned my relationship to all of the languages I know. 
Um, and even if English is clearly my strongest language, but the emotional consequences of learning English, writing in English, reading in, in English, all came with such a cost for me as a child. Uh, knowing English, speaking English, speaking English with the accent that I have, reading books in English, all of this represented a constant state of betrayal of my mother and father. And so I was never able to, you know, there was always that, that, that friction. Um, anyway, so that's a very long-winded explanation. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was speaking of languages. I was fascinated to learn from the lowland that in Bengali, the word for tomorrow is the same as the word for yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. And I was wondering whether this explains the fluidity with which in your, in this novel in particular, you manage the time shifts. And so, you know, th th there is sometimes a transition from sort of what happened yesterday to what's happening today to what will happen next day is, is sort of seamless. Well, and the book is also moving back and forth in time, right? I mean, the book is really born from a moment, born from a scene, born from one evening in which the paramilitary raids a little neighborhood and finds two boys and, 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 and kills them. And, and, and it's the recounting of that scene which is what we imagine 15, 20 minutes in real time, but then the, the reverberations, the repercussions of, of, of that contained unit of time is what the novel is really about in the end. But it keeps moving back and I mean, there's a sort of accordion effect, I think, in terms of how I work with time in the book, you know, in terms of going back to the scene, moving away from the scene, going back to the scene, moving away from the scene. But I think life is like that, you know? I think there are certain moments that have dominance, have, have, a, have a more prominent role, and they, they stand out against the backdrop of time. I mean, time is, is not linear the way that, I mean, it's certainly not linear from an emotional standpoint. Um, but I, I'm hardly the only novelist to, you know, think of this. Um, one final question, uh, just thinking back to uh, those two books you borrowed from your father's library um, for all those years. I imagine you weren't given a big fat library fine. <laughs> no, no, I was not. Um, but I think my father, who is a very law-abiding type of individual, um, was relieved to restore them to their rightful place on the shelf. Jumpa, it's been a real pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much Thank for you talking so much. to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I invite all to ir à tenda dos autógrafos, onde a Jumpa vai assinar os livros. Muito obrigado.